Megan Morris, Matthew Brown, Kyle Van Meter, who was an undergraduate in my lab, and then my collaborator in Mexico, Gustavo Hernandez Car Carmona. So I guess the best way to start the talk is to just kind of present you with the basic question that we're trying to address here. And that is, how do, organize, how do organisms survive periods of stressful environmental conditions? That's a fundamental question that we can all relate to. And so in doing this, um, <clears throat> I want you to think about a couple of different strategies that these can take. One of the strategies of surviving um, poor conditions is simply just be long-lived, weather them out, just outright, you know, just ride them out. Things you might see, you know, the, the large forests that we see, Cardone cactuses in Baja, these things are there for a long time. You have good periods of good and bad um, environmental conditions, and they just weather those bad conditions. Another way to do it is, within the adult stages, we might go through periods of uh, kind of reduced metabolic activity. You might think of this as torpor or hibernation or quiescent development, um, in which case you just, during the times that the, the, the periods are unfavorable for your you know, growth and survival, just go to sleep, reduce your metabolic, metabolic activity, and weather it that way. However, the one I want to focus on today is the idea of taking an alternate life stage, that is, the life stage that we're not generally looking at when we consider the species, and to have these things go through a period of arrested development or dormancy. And we might see this, a lot of work, the work has been done in copepods, diatoms, tardigrades, and things like this. So an example of this, just think about the Baja California desert. Very arid place, really depauperate of uh, plant life, not much rain, and then you have periods, it rains. And this is following the 97, 98 El Nino. You go down to Baja, and yes, this is the middle of Baja. You can see the Cardone cactuses, the Bujum trees, and so forth. And this thing could bloom, and it's beautiful. And all these things were not there during those long periods of drought, so to speak. And they came from a seed bank. I'll talk about that in a minute. You also might think about the California chaparral. And here we have a nice lush landscape. However, California chaparral, as so many other places, are prone to fire disturbances, which remove all of the above ground vegetation, basically kill everything above ground. And then immediately following this, you get this bloom of these ephemeral or opportunistic species that weren't really there prior to it. And these opportunistic species are taking advantage of the, re the reduction in competition, these renewing in resources, and having these populations that explode. And these things are often due to seed banks. And this is probably familiar to most, most of us here. We've thought about seed banks probably for a long time. These often have a very thick uh, fire-resistant coat, which allows them to survive um, the fires and allows them to, to survive the long periods of environmental, the poor environmental conditions. Now, um, when we look at seed banks, so we understand they allow populations to be annual, that is, to um, recruit during these periods of good conditions and then to write out the periods of bad conditions, they allow species to be opportunistic, that is, take advantage of these resource-renewing disturbances. And these things can be long-lived. They can live for years to decades. And we know a bit about the, what causes these things to come out of dormancy. And two of the big things is heat from the fires allows the, the seed coat to break, and a, that's one method. The other was chemical. And believe it or not, talking to John Keeley, um, who's an expert in this, you can actually dump liquid smoke on certain species of seeds and cause them to germinate. Um, and so the cues that cause these things to come out of dormancy may vary from species to species, but we do know there are specific cues that allow this, and they're generally tied in some way to the disturbance. And so <clears throat> if that's true, if, and it is true, I, I would argue very strongly that we know a lot about this, the question becomes, what about the marine algae? In particular, I'm going to talk about kelps. Do kelps have something like a seed bank? The problem with kelps is that they don't have that seed, that nice resistant dormant stage that's resistant to the disturbances. They have a life history, for many people in this room are aware of. We start with the adult sporophyte. They release spores, which disperse. They land, they grow into microscopic male and female gametophytes, which go through sexual reproductions, produce an embryonic stage, which then grows back into the juvenile stage and completes the life cycle. So, when we look at kelps and we understand that there's periods that the adult kelps are gone, they're either gone from a disturbance or from long periods of poor environmental conditions, and these stages are gone, if there is some sort of a seed bank analog, it's going to be one of these microscopic stages. And so my work really focuses on what's going on down here and how these things lead to recovery of the adults. So, um, if kelps do have a dormant life stage, it's got to be, must be one of these, then the questions I want to 
uh, posed today are what cues cause them to emerge in, from dormancy, what stages are the, the dormant stage, and what role do these play in the, say, persistence of kelps, recovery from disturbances, and how do these play out in establishing the patterns of biogeography? And so this is the hidden life of kelps because we just don't see these in the field. All right, so the first case I want to start with is something I started here on, in my master's degree. I actually started it in the, my subtitle ecology class with Mike Foster, where I was looking at Desmarestia ligulata. It's not a kelp, but it has a kelp-like life history. Its life history looks almost identical to that of a kelp. And so Desmarestia um, <clears throat> was first brought to my attention when we were working out in the water cove. Those of you who are in subtitle know these are the Pescadero rocks. Our subtitle sites are right out here. However, I was working with Ross Clark, who was another student here at the time, and we went out and we established these three experimental clearings to simulate the effects of a disturbance. In the, fire, in the terrestrial environment, fire is what removes the adult above-ground above vegetation. However, in the marine environment, that's typically a storm. Big waves come in, rip these guys out, and so we simulated that by simulating these, uh, these clearings, and we looked at what happened within these clearings. And the first thing that happened that I noticed as far as that, was, that brought me into this was that this species of brown algae, um, Desmarestia ligulata, recruited incredibly high densities, can exceed 100% bottom cover. That is, if you went to a place, sometimes you might have to dig through 10 plants to get to the bottom. And this is Ross Clark hiding in some Desmarestia on the bottom. And for those of you in subtitle, this kind of thing is probably coming. And so <clears throat> when we saw this, um, I went in and I looked at, so what's going on in these clearings and outside the clearings? And the first thing you notice, and this started, we did the first census in 92, carried this through 1997, and what you see is re recruitment in the clearings, on average, is much, much higher than it is under the canopies. And so if you look at the control canopies, Desmarestia stays very rare, just like those plants did under the, in the California chaparral, under those dense um, the chaparral canopies. It wasn't until you had that disturbance that renewed that resource that gave you that huge recruitment. And so these things certainly are opportunistic. That's one of the things that allows me to think maybe there's a sea bank. And then the other thing is we look at the timing. If you look at this is Desmarestia percent cover. This is a bunch of different canopy treatments. The one I want you to focus in on is where we removed both canopies. And what you see is there's periods each year where it drops to zero. And in fact, it's actually gone for several months of the year. And so by for being gone for several months of the year, if there's anything hanging out, it must be one of these microscopic stages. And then it recruits in the spring. And if you look at the timing of recruitment, this is day length modeled for Stillwater Cove. This is temperature measured within the cove. These red uh, dots are triangles that represent the date we first started seeing recruitment happen. They're incredibly annual, very predictable. And so the Desmarestia exhibited something that we might think is a case study to go look for microscopic stages that might be behaving like a seed bank, both annual and opportunistic. And so if, that, if true, I simply ask the question, does Desmarestia recruit from a seed bank? And to do this, I went into, the Des I went into Stillwater Cove following the disappearance of all the reproductive adults, so now there's no new spores being produced. If anything is out there, it's on the substrate right now, and it's sitting there lying dormant and waiting. And so, the way I did this is for my subtitle class is I developed these sterilization tents where these things would seal to the bottom. There's a clay gasket running around this. I'd inject fluorescein dye in here to check for leaks, made these things uh, tight to the bottom, and then would inject household bleach in here. And just for those of you who went, what? Um, household bleach when it reacts with water um, because basically salt. I tested for residual toxicity effects. There were none. I tested for effectiveness of this. It was 100% effective. It was a nice method of going in and saying, if there's a seed bank on the bottom, let's remove it and see what happens many months later. And so this is what one of these uh, plots look like. Here's the, the bolts I used to, to secure these things, some flagging that allowed me to identify it. There's a sterilized area. This is all Desmaresti around it. And so if you look at the data for this, if we look at the number of, sp of sporophytes per quarter meter squared, within the sterilized area and areas where we just remove the turf. We kind of remove those competitors. And we get a much higher. We're getting up to you know, 150, 200 plants per, uh, per quarter meter squared. You know, we're talking 800 individuals per meter squared versus basically nothing. Removing that seed bank several months prior was incredibly effective in shutting down reproduction or recruitment. And that's because we removed the seed bank. 
And so this told me that, yeah, there is a seed bank on the bottom. Remove it, and there's no, you don't get recruitment. You don't remove it, you get great recruitment later. So it allowed us to identify that, yes, yeah, something on the bottom, something microscopic is leading to Desmarestes recruitment. And so the question became next, well, what life history stage made this up? Is it the spore? Is it that embryonic spore fight? Or is it that gametophyte in the life history? And to do this, I used epifluorescent uh, microscopy staining. And so I went in. And I stained spore that I settled in the labs, put them onto slides, stained them with a calcifloor white or derivative fungiflor, I out this, which is a non-vital biostain that doesn't impact the physiology. I put these on slides, outplanted them to the field, bolted them down, and periodically through the winter when these things were uh, supposedly dormant and hanging out, I would collect them, bring them back to the lab, look at them under epifluorescent microscopy, and identify what I knew to be Desmarestia that I outplanted, versus all the other stuff that settles on them. And the take home from this, and this is from a paper I published on the methods of it, it's a, it's a nice one. These two gametophytes are only a day apart. One of them is fluorescing blue from the, uh, from the flungiflor, one of them is not, the, the chlorophyll is fl fluorescing. And we can identify stained versus non-stained gametophytes. And this allowed us to go in and say, all right, when we collect these things in the field, we can identify what, what, um, what we know to be Desmarest is sitting there, flip over to light microscopy, and identify its life stage. And every one we looked at were gametophytes. And this is what was hypothesized to be on the bottom already. So that wasn't new. It was just a nice verification of it. And so gametophytes, um, these haploid stages, are the microscopic stage that's sitting on the bottom. Now, <clears throat> if that's working for Desmoresti, and that was a nice case study, I then took this and said, all right, for the next about 10 years, I worked in this field with my students and collaborators to look at this within the kelps and ask, do we see the same thing? And one of the examples I just want to show you is some work I did with Gustavo Hernandez um, down from, um, uh, he's from La Paz. We were working in Baja, California, sir. And we were looking at giant kelp. And so here's Baja, here's Baja California, sir. This is the Vizcaíno Peninsula, Scammon's Lagoon, um, Guerrero Negro's up here, for those of you who are familiar with the area. And Punta San Roque out here, this is the southern limit. Actually, at Punta San Hipólito, which is right down here, is the southernmost giant kelp in the northern hemisphere. And this is really the southern range of giant kelp in our northern hemisphere, this area around here. And so we went to Punta San Roque and started working there. And we did, began this before the 97-98 El Nino, when macrocystis density, the red, was here at about 1 to 2 per um, uh, meter squared. And what we see is Izini, sorry, per, uh, per tenth of a meter squared, so that's about the average it is along the coast. We see Izenia density about two per meter squared. And before, then the ENSO hit, and these both dropped to almost zero. The giant kelp macrocystis disappeared completely. Izenia didn't disappear completely, but about 90% of it was lost. It's a little more tolerant to the ENSO conditions. However, that was enough for Izenia to really rapidly recover. And for a period of a couple years, Izenia was, hot, was really abundant, and macrocystis was gone for years out of this period. And then suddenly, in 99, macrocystis began to recover as Izenia populations declined. So this looked to me like Izenia might be behaving like that giant kelp canopy in, uh, reduced Desmarestia cover, cover. It looked to me like uh, Izenia was reducing macrocystis recruitment. So <clears throat> to ask what's going on there, we went in, we simply did some experiments, and if we hypothesize that there is a seed bank on the bottom and all you need to do is remove its competitor and to get giant kelp recruitment, we followed up with some experiments on this. And so the way we first did this is we simply looked at the relationship between Izenia density and juvenile macrocystis recruitment. There's no way a little blade like this is keeping out um, Izenia for us, but we thought that Izenia might be reducing macrocystis recruitment. And if you look at the relationship, over about 1,500 quadrats, those even kelp force talking about doing five or six quadrats, we did over 1,500 quadrats doing this. And what we looked at is this incredibly strong negative relationship such that when Izenia got abundant, macrocystis just, recruitment just dropped away. And so this told us, ah, this might be what's going on, but correla correlation is not causation. And so we went in and we did some experiments to, within the Izenia forest. And what we did is we went towards very dense and removed it and asked the question, is there a macrocystis seed bank under the Izenia? And here's what these experiments look like. Here's a diver for scale. This is all the Izenia around it. We created these three replicate 100 square meter clearings and then went back six months later to see what was going on. And the thing was, is when we're driving out there, the visibility down here could be really poor. This is a very good day. And as we're driving up to these things, I remember looking at my, my GPS going, God, I hope we could find this place. It's going to be so bad. It's going to be so bad. 
of visibility down there. And as we're driving up to it, what do we see? No mattresses along the coast except for three perfectly square, 100 square meter mattresses for us. It was amazing. As we're driving up, I looked at that. I looked at it as we're driving the boat up to it going, no way. And it was true. And, these, and very dense. And so all we did was remove the competitor. And boom, we got it. So there was a seed bank below it. And you can look six months after we did the clearing, we got a lot of uh, uh, macrocystis recruitment, almost nothing in the control. We got a single macrocystis in one of the controls. 12 months later, we still see a, a pattern. It's starting to recover. And it wasn't until about a two years later that we got full recovery. So this told us that, yeah, macrocystis did have a bank of microscopic stages waiting, sitting there dormant. All you needed to do was have that resource ruining disturbance of removing its competitor, just like we saw with Desmarestia. And so <clears throat> that being the case, I want to talk to you now about some of the work my students have been doing that has followed up on this. In particular, I'm going to talk about, this is my first cohort of students, Damien C., who went on to do a PhD at Scripps, Paul Matson, who went to do a PhD at uh, UC Santa Barbara, and Laura Carney, she did her doctorate with me and went on to Scripps to do her postdoc. Um, three really good first set of students who are really good in the field and very good at what they did. So I was really blessed with this. And so the first work was uh, I want to talk about is Dr. Uh, Carney's, Laura's. And if she went into Point Loma. And if you just take a look at nitrate levels in Point Loma through a period of time, we see this nice seasonal fluctuation. And what we do is she went in, if you look at when the zoospores are being released from the adults, they're here. But when we look at when the recruitment happens or the peak recruitment happens, it's offset a little bit. Recruitment's happening when the nitrate levels are really high, um, even though spore release is happening sometime before that. So they're offset in time. And so Laura went in and, re and asked the same kinds of questions I asked with Desmarestia, where she went in and she sterilized some of these, she hand cleared some of these, and she looked at the, if the seed bank was there and she removed the seed bank. And so <clears throat> we can look at the data for Macrocystis periphery, Laminaria farloii, one of our dominant Laminaria species down there, and Pterogophora californica. And what I want to point out here is it's not until several, mo several months later that you really start to see the open circles, which are going to be the sterilized ones beginning to catch up. But removing the gametophyte bank delayed recruitment of the species a, a recovery to the full assemblage for three to four months. So there was a big impact of removing that um, seed bank that was already there compared to something new spores that were just landing. So it certainly looked to us like the exact same thing we had seen before. And so if you take a look at this, this graph again, she installed her treatments here. We see our first recruitment from just the hand-cleared sites, which are not sterilized. And then several months later, we finally get the recruitment from the sterilized ones. A nice test that really uh, backs up what we saw with the other species, that remove the seed bank and you delay recruitment. And you now have to have new spores land to seed that bottom. That takes time. However, what I want to point out here is that sometimes we get no recruitment following it. And sometimes we get recruitment, but it's offset. So why only recruitment sometimes, and why the delay? And so Laura went in and looked at what causes these guys to come out of their kind of quiescent or dormant stage. And it, as I showed you before, in the, in the seed bank, it could be the heat from the fire or chemicals. She went in. She actually thought it was nitrate. When I first did the Desmarestia, I thought it was photo period. Um, Laura proved me wrong, I think. And so I went, she went in. And the way she did this is she cultured macrocystis in the lab under um, limiting nutrient and light conditions for a period of time, for about three months. And she held these things in this quiescent state as if they're under low light, poor nutrient conditions like you would expect these guys to be hanging out. These are these poor conditions. And then she transferred these things um, to areas where she had non-limiting nutrients. And like she had as much uh, nitrate and light as you needed. She added as much nitrate but kept light limiting. She kept nitrate limiting and added light. And then she kept them both limiting. And then she collected a, a data for egg production and sporophyte recruitment. So she looked at uh, basically uh, them become fertile and producing sporophytes. And the data for this are actually really cool. On the left side of the graph is where you've given them nitrate and you have plus or minus light. On the right side of the graph, you kept nitrate limiting and then you give them plus or minus light. If you keep nitrate limiting, you get no eggs, no sporophytes. If you make nitrate non-limiting, doesn't matter what you do with the light, they're going to produce eggs, they're going to produce sporophytes. It was nitrate that brought this out. And she did a lot of nice work manipulating the specific nitrate, the vitamins and everything, and looked at what affected growth, what affected um, fecundity and stuff. And that's way too much to talk about here. It's in a series of three or four papers. 
However, she did a really nice job in convincing me that, nope, it wasn't light, it was nitrate, nutrients that were doing this. And so then she asked, well, what about other species? Does delaying, see, do we see this in other species? And does the length of delay matter? And so what she did is she delayed things for either not delayed, she delayed them for a couple of weeks or a month, she transferred them to non-delay conditions, and she determined how quickly they produced sporophytes. And the answer is actually, for this is really cool. If you look at the different species, everything from the left side of each graph is non-delayed, and we're increasing the delay time going across. What we see in all cases, as you increase the delay time, the time for sporophytes decreases. This is going from right away up to 50 days. The lower on the y-axis is a quicker recruitment. These things actually recruit more quickly if you delay them. And I, we think it's because it takes them time to, through metabolic processes, to build up the energy and the machinery to go through re reproduction and produce sporophytes. Um, however, the take home from this is we see it across a number of species, and we see as you delay them longer, it's better for them as far as how quickly they produce sporophytes. <clears throat> and so from this, we began to say, OK, this is widespread throughout the kelps. Delaying does help them. It allows them to write out the poor conditions, and it conveys some advantage for how quickly they uh, recruit. We were beginning to wonder, well, what, in, what does this have for basically kelp ecology? How does this play out in things like regional patterns of biogeography? How about local patterns of biogeography? How about depth? And these are things I want to address today from some of my other students. So Dr. Uh, Paul Matson is here. He, began to, he looked at what the effect is of these microscopic stages, this hidden life, if you will, on, um, uh, on recruitment of kelps. And he worked with Pterogophora californica and Isenia arborea, two species that we see here um, around our, our coast, and we see them in our subtitle um, ecology class. The thing about these things is they both have a northern limit up around Vancouver Island. They occur along our coast. However, Pterogophora stops around Bihir Rosario in Baja California, whereas Isenia goes down to Mag Bay in Baja California Sur. So there's an area of sympatry and an area of allopatry, right? And so Without going too much into it, because this is a talk about the microscopic stages, not the adult stages, he looked at temperature nutrient relationships, growth, what's going on in the tissues, and what he found is the variation in the adults is not explained by temperature and nutrients. Um, I'm just going to leave that there for sake of time, but the adults do just fine in these conditions, in, in, um, in both in, regardless of the temperature and nutrients. However, the question became, what about the microscopic stages? And so to do this, we went again to an area of sympatry, an area of allopatry, and we looked at San Diego and Asuncion, which are nice two candidates. We went in, we looked at temperatures in these sites, and here's the temperature and, and plots for these two sites. And what we do is we can identify kind of a lower limit that they both would expect or to experience, and kind of an upper limit where really, with the exception of a few very small blips, the San Diego does not experience this stuff. So we have kind of an area of that, that both would ex experience and one that only really Isenia experiences. And we cultured the microscopic stages under these conditions to ask, does temperature affect them the same? Or if they affect them differently, might that explain why Isenia goes further south? It's not the adults again. And so what Paul did is he cultured these things under two temperatures, 12 and 18 degrees. He varied the nutrients, the, uh, the, night, the nutrient levels across a, a, a range from 0.2 up to 20. Um, he cultured these for 10 weeks, and then he measured sporophyte production. And the data for this, again, are one of these things that's really clear. Um, what we see is that for Isenia, they take a while to recruit, and then once they begin to recruit, we see that there's really no difference. If anything, Isenia is doing a little bit better in the warmer water, but it's not statistically different. Um, however, maybe a slight trend for Isenia doing better in warmer conditions. Pterogophora, however, does not recruit at all. Everything died under those 18 conditions. It is the microscopic stages that cannot survive these lower latitude temperatures. The adults do fine. Isenia does fine. Pterogophora can't hang on down here. They both do fine. Um, um, and um, Isenia they, they does fine under both temperatures. Pterogophora only recruits under the colder temperatures. So from this, it told us that the reason the biogeography of these guys is different is not due to the adults. It's due to this bottleneck at the microscopic stages. And it's just that pterogophora can't survive down there. <clears throat> OK, so if, uh, that's an example for looking at things in um, uh, regional biogeography. Well, what about an example for local biogeography? Um, and today, I want to talk about depth. And I, when I first put this talk together, I actually had included a bunch of work from Mike Graham's master's thesis 
Um, for those of you who haven't read it, it's a nice piece of work looking at giant kelp done here in Stillwater Cove. And Mike did some really nice work showing that the microscopic stages are very sensitive to high light. Um, and in fact, the gametophytes are might be a little more sensitive than those embryonic sporophytes. I'll just leave that there, and I'll let you talk to Mike about um, the specifics of that, because I want to talk about what my students have been doing here. Um, and so, yeah, give them credit. Mike, you get enough. You get enough credit. <laughs> and so my first one I want to talk about is this is work by Stacy Faytek. Um, we did some nice work. Stacy's now doing a PhD at UCLA. Um, and she looked at the El Kelp Pelagophycus pora. Down at, this, uh, this is a deep water one out of Catalina in Point Loma. They grow very big. Um, and she went in and realized that we have a pattern in the San Diego and Point Loma. This is Point Loma here. San Diego Bay is over here. This is the Point Loma kelp forest. That's a, one of the best studied kelp forests in the world. And what we have here is we have an area outside the forest in deep water where pelagophycus is abundant. And then we have the giant kelp forest. And then we have inside it where really this transitions to an egregia or a feather boa canopy. But we have a situation where Phlagophycus does not invade the kelp, the, the, the macrocystis forest. And we were one thinking that, okay, maybe it's just being outcompeted. We did a bunch of clearing experiences, experiments in here. It's not due to competition. I'll show you that a little bit in a bit. Um, however, just take from that, it is not due to the fact that macrocystis is outcompeting pteragophora. Or sorry, um, Phlagophycus. So what Stacy did, at these things, she went in and said, well, is it the adults? Let's transfer, let's take adults, transfer them into the middle and see how they do. You see if it's the adults. And so she went out, here's some transplant stuff. Transplanting kelps is actually a really easy thing to do. All you need to do is get some uh, polypro rope, untwist it, you stick a hold fast through it, we, we twist it, nail it down, they will attach pretty quickly. And we can transplant this into the deep, mid, and shallow zones. So we're taking um, Plagophycus, removing them, transplanting some of them back as a procedural control, and then transplanting others into the shallower depths, and just seeing, can the adults even come shallower? And you know, we measure things like growth, survival, fecundity, and photosynthetic stress. And these are really, again, compelling data. It's amazing. Um, you, you look at this and you go, well, we did three runs of this experiment. You look at Plagophycus growth. Absolutely no difference, no matter where you put them. The adults do the, the adult sporophytes do the same in shallow water or deep water. It is not the adults that are limited here. Furthermore, we look at fecundity. And for a couple of, for a long time, they're not fecund, but by about six months into the experiments, the very inshore ones, 100% of them became fecund. And by the termination of the experiment in, within the macrocystis beds, they also uh, became uh, fecund. However, they never did in the deeper water. And that's because natural populations generally take a couple of years to slowly grow all the way to the surface where they can now get in the bright light, produce the energy to produce their sori and their reproductive structures. If you transplant them into half their depth or even shallower, you just sped up that process. You put them starting near the surface, they get to the surface faster, and they actually become reproductive earlier. So not only do the adults do as well in the shallower zones, they might actually even do a little bit better. And we can look at photosynthetic, um, uh, the, the light harvesting part of photosystem too. And here we use PAM fluorometry. This is pulse amplitude modulated fluorometry. It allows us to look at, if everyone remembers their, um, their, their photosynthesis, their two photosystems, this measures the electron transport chain in photosystem too. And we can look at a measure of stress and how quickly these guys are, are how well they're utilizing light. And so this is what, it, what we call uh, photosynthesis versus irradiance. It's actually an electron transport chain versus irradiance curve. And as you increase light on the bottom from zero all the way up to really saturating irradiances, things immediately begin to increase their photosynthesis. They'll saturate at a point, and then they'll photoadapt and, and start going down. And so we can measure some parameters here, photosynthetic efficiency, the saturation point of photosynthesis, and their maximum rate of electron transport. And what we see is that the deepest ones are actually having the lowest rates of photosynthesis. They're actually doing better in shallower water. And so once again, it's not the adults. It's got to be one of, these micros the, one of the microscopic stages. And so to do this, we can go in, and what St Stacy did is went in and did experiments with the microscopic stages. And so she cultured these things in petri dishes within the lab. She cultured them under 12 degrees in um, enriched seawater. She did them under very low lights, things you might find very deep, um, say in a plagophycus bed. She then had transported them some in um, a, a macrocystis bed. So she actually did that transplant experiment or the correlative in the lab. 
She held them for a while under plagophycus conditions and transported them, some of them up to macrocystis depth conditions. And then she sampled them for egg and embryonic sporophyte production. And so, in the photosynthetic state. And so the first thing to look at is the photosynthetic state, because the other stuff actually is going to become pretty clear in a second. Um, if we look at under low light, and we look at their quantum yield, which is about 0.56, it's how efficiently they're, um, they're utilizing light, it's pretty good. They're, they have a very steep photosynthetic efficiency, about double what it is in high light, they're photosynthesizing more efficiently. Their quantum yield is much higher, their maximum rate of photosynthesis is higher, and even though the saturation state is off, this is high light, so we expect things to saturate higher. We look at the measures of photosynthesis, which is quantum yield, electron transport rate, and photosynthetic efficiency, and they do much better in low light. As a matter of fact, all the microscopic stages, every one of them ended up dying under high light. Really clear example that they could not handle this high light. Everything died, they had lower photosynthesis um, uh, parameters, they were stressed. But the question becomes, well, yeah, but what about, what if it's just something artificial about this culturing technique? If, it's, if it is, we should be able to culture macrocystis right side by side with these guys, and macrocystis should also die, right? Because that would be, if it's our, something artifact of our experiments, we should expect to see macrocystis follow the same path. However, if we compare plagophycus and macrocystis under the same thing, what we see here is that plagophycus is the graph I just showed you under that high light. Um, this is macrocystis. Quantum yield is much higher. Alpha photosynthetic efficiency is much higher. Electron transport chain is much higher. These guys, actually that 0.54, is pretty close to this 0.56. Macrocystis under high light is behaving like plagophycus under low light. They're adapted, these microscopic stages which reside only on the bottom and are very specific conditions are responding really to their local conditions. And it's this high light conditions within the macrocystis bed that um, prevents them from um, establishing uh, populations. And we did some experiments where we went in, we seeded, and s not everything worked with their stuff. Uh, we did some clearings, and we uh, were, were not able to get recruitment. Recruitment could be finicky sometimes on um, actually getting the adults to produce. But it certainly seems the adults do better or as well in shallow water. The microscopic stages just crap out in, in, the, in the shallow water to the highlight. So this told us that the depth distribution of plagophycus is almost certainly set by the microscopic stages. I should point out, I'm not going to show you data for this today. Stacy also took sporogenic reproductive material, transported it into the bed to make sure that it wasn't a dispersal thing. And we looked at the, the recruitment shadows around the sporogenic material. You do that in the deep, you get this amazing recruitment around it. You do it in the shallow, you get nothing. So the microscopic stages, again, weren't doing well in the shallow water. <coughs> and so um, we can then ask a little bit more about this side of spore dispersal. And this is Damien C. here. Um, Damien did some nice work about um, looking at the spores and began to ask, what about environmental impacts on the spores? Everything I've talked about so far is those microscopic gametophytes or the embryonic sporophytes. I haven't really addressed spores yet, which is that other life stage. And so Damien went in to point the Point Loma Forest, and he began to look at this stage here. And what Damien did is assumed that if you go to a kelp bed, we know that within a kelp bed, as you um, are within, a, within our coastal environment, as waves pass over, almost everything at the bottom is going to be um, back and forth. So if you look at this, right, as you're at, when you're at the bottom here, it's all back and forth, right? This orbital is flattened out, that energy just accelerates in this way. But as you move off the bottom, <coughs> these orbitals begin to expand in the, um, up, up in the vertical direction. And by the time you get to the top, we know that things are just kind of circular, right? You look on the top, you put a tennis ball in the water. It doesn't go way back and forth like you do on the bottom. It kind of does this. And so anyone knows who dives, right? You're on the surface kind of going back and forth. But if it's a big wave day, you get to the bottom, you run back and forth, right? And so Damien was curious. If these things are releasing spores, can they get up into the water column? And if they can get up into the water column and get a, take advantage of this vertical vector in the, the wave orbitals, they might be able to take advantage of these unidirectional currents and increase their dispersal potential. And we all know also that if you, if you dive, that when you're on the surface and you're in these strong currents, you just drop to the bottom, those currents often go away because of friction at the bottom, right? And so what we see here is that um, if these things can take um, advantage of these things, they might increase their dispersal potential. However, Damien was worried about if you got up here, you're also in this highlight environment. So the first thing he did was just simply ask, do these things get off the bottom? <coughs> 
And Damien built these things. He called them vertical sp spore profilers. They're bolted to the bottom, extended at the top with a buoy. They had plates. Here's one of these plates. Each of these plates um, has, had a bezeled in uh, slide, which he would then look for spore settlement on. And he would put these things out in the forest. He'd put these things out in the center of the forest, to the north part of the forest, to the southern part of the forest, and monitored sp uh, spore settlement. Asked, are the spores even getting up there? And the data for this um, here are pretty clear. Also, we look at the height off the bottom for the southern, central, and northern part, going from the bottom all the way up. And here are the different sites. And what we see is that spores are actually getting up 10 meters off the bottom. And it's a nice um, exponential decay, but we do see them getting off the bottom. We don't see as much down here, because actually the water flows this way. It's a, weird, it's a weird place as it comes out of San Diego Bay. So the spores are traveling northward through the bay, so we see a little more effects up here and not so much down here because there's not as much of a spore source down here that feeds it. However, this take home from this is that these things get off the bottom and get up to near the surface. So yeah, maybe they are taking advantage of this, um, these unidirectional currents and being able to transport long distances. The problem with that is, is it's brighter at the surface. And so you can look at this as sim a simple, ta just taking a quantum sphere um, um, light meter, dropping it down and doing a, a profile of the ocean, right? It's, uh, a profile of light. As you increase in depth, irradiance decreases. And we can take a couple of places where near the surface, maybe we're up near 1,000 micro-Einsteins of light. In the center, we're at maybe two to 500. At the bottom, maybe 30, 50, or in that range. And so we can go in and say, OK, well, let's take a look at how depth, now light, impacts those, those spores. And do we see the same kinds of things we, that Stacy saw with her plagophytes and that there's going to be some negative impact? And so what Damien did is set up this thing in the lab where we ended up buying this horticulture light, which would pump out up to 2,000 micro-Einsteins of light. He actually had to wear sunglasses to do these experiments. He had, this generated so much heat, we had to create a water bath to hold temperature con, uh, constant. And then we would see these things, and each of these runs would give us a different light. As you moved out of the shadow, we can measure the irradiance. And so we met, cultured these things under 70, between 75 and 1,000 micromoles of light, and we exposed them for different time periods and simply asked, what are the effects of irradiance on these spores? And the data for this are here. We can look at spore settlement, and we can look at spore fight production. And if you take a look at this, there's uh, radiance from 75 all the way up to 1,000 microinsons of light on both graphs. With each of these, the colors represent how long they're exposed, everything from one hour to 12 hours. And we see this pattern where, with increasing irradiance, we see a general decrease in settlement and a decrease in spore fight production such that by the time you get to 1,000 micromoles, it doesn't matter how long you expose them to, there's no sporophytes are produced. And once you get up to about uh, you know, 1,000 micromoles, it, it's, um, once you get up to these levels here, even if you expose them for you know, only a, a few hours, to, say a daylight, you're going to get a daytime, you're going to get no sporophyte production. That is both the intensity of the light and how long you're exposed are causing negative impacts to the spores. And that's conveyed through settlement and through sporophyte production. So the spores are really sensitive to these high light levels. And so when Damien uh, and I uh, were talking about this, and he, and he proposed that this was a, a method for long distance spore dispersal, we saw this and went, maybe not. Uh, because this might be a dead end. They might get up there, but they're really going to have negative impacts. Maybe they do it at night. And if they do it at night, they can avoid the irradiance impacts. They still got to get to the bottom, right? So then I began to wonder, well, if they do it at night, um, are there any, is there any other reason why you don't want to be up in the water column? Well, you've been in a kelp bed. What about grazing? And so this is work by a former undergraduate student of mine, Kyle Van Meter, who actually published this in Journal of Psychology. Um, and Kyle went in and simply looked at mycids. And what we did is we looked at two depths. We looked at kind of the midwater near the bottom and the surface, and we did 50-meter plankton toes and simply looked at the mycid distribution. Are mycids even more abundant at the surface? If, if the mycids are evenly distributed, it doesn't matter where you are, your grazing impact should be about the same. But if mycids are more abundant near the surface, and that's what we're talking about, then maybe this can be another negative impact to the dispersal. And so um, Kyle looked at this, and so once he uh, found that mycids were indeed more abundant near the surface, he then did some uh, laboratory experiments where we exposed mycids. Um, after we starved them, we cleared their guts. We exposed them to um, uh, swimming zoospores within uh, culture dishes for a period of time, put slides below them after a period of grazing time, took those slides out, and simply looked at what was settling and seeing did the mycids 
knock down spore settlements. And so the other thing we did is we looked at their guts. And if you take with, uh, mycids without spores, we've starved them, and you look at epifluorescent microscopy, there's the mycid right, gut right there. This is the gut part of it. We see nothing going on there. But look at what happens when we have the mycids with spores. The red, as I mentioned earlier in that blue versus red uh, picture I showed you earlier, chlorophyll fluoresces red under UV light, and it's a nice proxy for looking at how much chlorophyll is in the gut. And these guts were loaded with red fluorescence. These were not. These were packed with zoospores. They were eating them. And so the question became, well, what, is, what is effect did that have? And so we can look at the number of settled spores, per what we're just going to call field of view here. And we did this, again, in the light during daytime. We did this at night as well. Um, and what we see is without the red, without grazers present, just dishes where you settle the spores, you let the spores um, in the dishes and you just let them settle naturally with no grazing pressure, we had almost a doubling of settlement versus when you had the grazers present. So grazers were taking out about half of the settlement. Didn't matter on daytime or night. These are not visual predators. These things are filter feeders. And so this um, didn't matter day or night. So this whole idea of maybe if your spores get up at nighttime, you could uh, avoid these irradiance effects. You're not going to avoid the grazers. So this told us that, yeah, the spores, we can measure them getting up off the water column. And this may be a mess method for long distance dispersal, but there's a lot of things these things deal with that are new, and that are novel, and they're not experiencing at the bottom. And so <clears throat> um, with this, um, we kind of uh, took a step back and said, OK, well, the other thing that's happening is even if these guys get up there, even if the spores disperse a long period, they still got to get down. I showed you Damien's work, these vertical um, uh, you know, distributions of zoospores coming off the bottom with an exponential decay. To get down, you got to have the same mechanism. You got to write it so you can have a further exponential decay going down. And so we're not actually certain that this is, is a method for long distance dispersal like we originally thought. <clears throat> OK, so then <clears throat> the last couple of things um, I wanted to talk about is that if, we've, if I have convinced you that the microscopic stages are important, and they are important for allowing these things to withstand poor environmental conditions, to be annual, to recover from disturbances, to be opportunistic. If I've convinced you that, hey, we can begin to identify what are the cues that bring these things out of dormancy, what advantage does dormancy convey to them, how important are these microscopic stages and setting patterns of biogeography and depth. Um, if I've convinced you on that, then the next step that I'd like to just talk to you about is, well, where are we going from here? And this is work by two students of mine, uh, Matt Brown, who's now at Oregon State doing his uh, PhD, and this is a current student of mine, Priya Shukla. And they're looking at the effects of climate change. So where are we all going? We're all going into a changing climate. Right? And so the famous Keeling curve, we know the, warm, the water is getting warmer and more acidic. Um, we know that CO2 is it, um, increasing in the water. So these two things of temperature and um, acid, uh, uh, increased CO2 within the water might be important to the kelps. They're certainly important to a whole host of other organisms. And so uh, Matt Brown's work looked at the macrocysts, the, the growth of uh, the adult macrocysts, or the sporophytes. And he exposed these things to what we call future conditions, which is about 1,500 parts per million uh, um, CO2 and about 15 degrees Celsius. He elevated temperature um, to 15 degrees. And then he had a present day one, which is going to be about 12 degrees Celsius and about um, uh, 500 parts per million uh, CO2. And then he just elevated CO2. So we had these nice orthogonal contrasts of elevating both temperature and CO2 independently and together. And you look at growth. And what we see is this is the weight of the al algae going across and elevated temperature. We really get no growth. In fact, toward the end, we start getting a deterioration. That's not surprising, as I'm going to show you. We've known for a long time. Warm temperatures are bad for kelps. Um, however, w look what happens when you elevate temperature and CO2 together. They actually have a CO2 fertilization effect. And we actually think that this is the f due to the fact that this increased temperature, although it's causing a negative impact, it does raise um, enzyme activity, some metabolic processes, and you give it added CO2 fertilization, and we get actually an enhanced growth compared to if present day or if we just elevate CO2. And so we can look at this. The photosynthesis follows the same as growth. This is going to be carbon uptake um, through photosynthesis, um, carbon uptake you know, to be used in the carbon reduction cycle. Um, we can look at that under irradiance. This is steady state stuff. And so what we see is the lowest 
rates of photosynthesis are under elevated temperature. Again, the two middles are current temperature and elevated CO2. And the fastest is under future conditions. What we think is happening here is you're elevating the CO2 in the water. Um, CO2 is becoming more available. Um, these guys, due to the temperature, have increased um, enzyme activity. And the enzymes are really important in allowing conversion of bicarbonate to CO2 um, within the water and allowing for more carbon to go into photosynthesis. And we think that this is a combination of uh, carbon fertilization and just enhanced metabolic, metabolic activity. We're not certain about that yet. That takes a lot more exper um, work to figure out. However, there is a clear impact that climate change is going to impact the adult kelps or the sporophyte kelps. It may in increase um, in the, uh, the future conditions, but elevated temperature really does poorly. They do poorly. And in fact, if you look at these things at the termination of the experiment, this is under ambient, under CO2, even though there's no differences in photosynthesis here or growth rate, you can see these guys are a little bit bleached out. There seems to be some sort of an acidity impacts here that are negative. We couldn't detect that physiologically or growth-wise, but it certainly looks like there's some sort of a negative effect qualitatively. However, these weren't different. Elevate the temperatures, and these the guys start to die. Elevate them together, and they grow like gangbusters. I mean, these things are growing and splitting, and these meristems are going like gangbusters. And so there certainly seems to be some um, connection between climate change and physiology of the kelps. I'm not saying kelp forests are going to do better. In fact, with climate change also comes increased storm activity, increased ENSO events, changes in inter interaction webs, food web dynamics, and all sorts of stuff, some of which I talked to the kelp forest class earlier today about. But so the, what's going to happen to the kelp forest certainly is not demonstrated here. I'm just talking about physiology of the individual kelps. But it certainly seems that there's a, a, a benefit here. What about the microscopic stages? Priya went in and is doing some work right now looking at sporophyte production and gametophyte um, survival. And what, if we look at gametophyte survival over time, these guys actually appear to survive best under elevated CO2. The current conditions and the future conditions are not distinguishable, and elevated temperature knocks them down. So that's the same thing we would expect, at least the current conditions being in the middle. There's a flip between future conditions and elevated CO2, very likely because these guys are not as metabolically needy of these things. And, although, and when you elevate CO2 and temperature together, you get this great response in the, um, within the, uh, the sporophytes. That's not the case in the microscopic stages. We still have some work to do on this, but it looks like just giving them some elevated CO2, and these guys are all basically surface area, and just giving them a little bit more CO2 allows for the CO2 fertilization. You don't need the temperature to go along with it. We don't know that yet. However, there certainly seems to be some impact of um, climate change on the microscopic stages. And it's not exactly the same as we see in the adult, in the adult sporophyte stages. So the take home from, <clears throat> from all of this is that when we look at the kelp forests and we look at the kelps themselves, and we begin to ask questions about, well, what sets their biogeography? What's really driving kelp forest ecology? Historically, we've been so interested in looking at the, adult, at the big stages because that's what we can see, that's what we can manipulate, and that's what we can study. Everything else we've really been to have to do in the lab, and we've had to kind of make um, predictions or, or links to what's happening in the field. However, when you begin to look at these things, and we begin to understand that these microscopic stages are no longer this black box that we used to talk about, really this hidden life. It's a life that's kind of exploding with these questions, these unanswered questions about how they really play out in looking at the biogeography and the ecology of the, the adult kelps. And certainly, the microscopic stages are differentially impacted by a number of environmental factors than are the big sporophytes. And if you really want to understand where things are and where they ain't, uh, more, more uh, appropriately, really, the answer is not always going to be found in those adult stages where we've looked. You've got to start looking at these microscopic stages or this hidden life. All right? Um, so having said all that, um, and just to uh, conclude, with this, I just want to uh, just take on the kelps rely on a, back, a bank of microscopic stages to survive periods of poor environmental conditions and recover following disturbance, much in the way interests of plants do. Um, hope I've convinced you of that. Um, the gametophyte appears to be the life stage that makes up the seed bank. We haven't looked at this across a whole bunch of species, but where it has been looked at, it's been identified as the gametophyte and other um, kelp ecologists before me have predicted, Paul Dayton, Louis Drool, people like that have predicted that it's going to be the gametophyte. That wasn't exactly something that I, dis I discovered. Um, nutrients uh, are the most important factor regulating the seed bank development and reproduction. This is something that it's great when your students prove you wrong. 
um, and you get to go, oh, wow, you know, I actually thought it was one thing, and they show you experimentally with pretty good data that, it's, that you had it wrong and that it's something else. Um, always be willing to write, allow yourself to be wrong and allow yourself to learn from um, your students because very often, you know, they're doing this better than you did. Um, delaying development, or that is entering the seed bank, enhances per capita reproductive su success. It reduces the time needed to sexually reproduce un under non-limiting condition. And there's also reduces the effects of density, depend density dependence and inbreeding. I don't have time to go into this. Laura did some really nice work looking at the effects of density dependence and how this actually ameliorates the effects of that too. However, this idea that um, this time needed to sexually reproduce under non-limiting conditions, this could be huge. If you think about a whole bunch of uh, species that are on the bottom under poor conditions, uh, you know, they're light, they'll be limited by the canopy, the canopy is removed, now conditions are going to allow you to reproduce and produce your next generation. If you can do anything to get ahead of your neighbor, to get in first and get above them, that's going to play out a huge um, co um, role in your ability to outcompete them. If delaying allows you to enhance the rate at which you're doing that, then delaying my, um, development can certainly not only allow you to survive poor periods, but it gives you a competitive advantage coming out of those poor periods when you go into good periods. Um, and so that's something that definitely needs to have more work done. Um, and I look forward to people figuring out ways of kind of dis studying that. Um, the seed banks are sensitive to environmental conditions, often very differently than are the adult sporophytes. And this can be, in, again, integral in establishing patterns of local or regional patterns of biogeography. Um, so I'm going to end here and just say one last thing that I didn't talk about, but I'm more than happy to talk about. We've actually begun working with some microbial ecologists to look at the role of microbes. And it's amazing that some of the microbes associated with the adult kelps, things like iron processing, things like that, we see those same things going on with the gametophytes. And we actually see if we strip some of these microbes away, the gametophytes tank. The gametophytes need these microbial communities. Some work, uh, nice work done by uh, Liz Dinsdale, who's a collaborator with Forrest Rower, who was here um, a couple of, uh, um, at the beginning of the semester. We've been working with Megan Morris, one of her students, and has found some really nice links between the microbial communities and the uh, fate of the gametophytes. And it looks like my microbes are inherently important and they need them to behave properly. And so <clears throat> I guess when I'm when, uh, studying kelps and uh, bi uh, kelp biogeography and, and ecology, it's the little things that matter. Um, and in this case, I hope I've convinced you that it certainly is. Um, and so with, with that being said, I want to say thank you very much. You know, this is what was a talk that I gave that, with the exception of how I introduced it with myself, and I did that so that, mostly so that the people in kind of in the subtitle college and the people, you know, all the students here can see about how you might take something you're doing for your masters and let go of it. You've got to let go of ownership sometimes, right? You, you know, we do things and then we work collaboratively with a bunch of people, and this is kind of how you might... Um, take an entire group of you know, generations of students and integrate them into a conceptual framework, however, allowing them to each have their own independent experiments that they all get to design and run independently, rather than just kind of giving them each a task to do. They all came up with these ideas on their own, and I'm, I don't take credit for the developing the ideas of any of my students in here. They did fantastic jobs. So with that respect, um, <clears throat> I want to thank uh, these, uh, those guys and the beer pigs, and I guess I'm up on the beer pigs uh, after this. Um, to uh, get to get grilled, but I want to leave that there and, and just say, you know, everyone, thanks for uh, having me here. It's been great, um, and also thanks for having me at Moss Landing. It's been great. Um, so, having said all that, I guess I'll uh, close there and take any questions. Shown these things can go kilometers. They're rare when they get out that way. 
One of the things I haven't talked about is kelps can not only disperse in, as individual spores, but then follow what you might call a modified gas diffusion. You know, open a scuba tank full of blue air, right? And as you move away from it, it's going to get less and less, you know, more, more faint. As you move that down, that's going to kind of disperse. That, that dispersal shuttle will, will move in a direction, but also disperse and become more diffuse. And so Dan has kind of looked at this stuff thinking about, you know, how do these things move over long distances? And by the time you get quite a bit away, it's really a probabilistic event of getting um, recruitment because you'd have to have two spores of opposite sexes land right next to each other within on average of about a millimeter or so of each other to get this. So it's a very much, it's not just individuals, it's actually you have to cut this in half because you have to be, well, a quarter because you have to have two land and they have to be opposite sexes, right? And so um, the work has shown that these things actually go several kilometers, um, but we haven't put these in the models yet with these rates of grazing and irradiance. That would be a great thing to do. I mean, I'd, I'd love to talk to Brian and people like that to, to do that, but we haven't done it yet. Okay. I was going to ask, um, you know, ecologists have spent a lot of time <coughs> looking at the role of grazing on the macroscopic algae and kelps. Um, some people think it's really important, some people don't. What about the role of benthic grazers on the sea bank? Um, <laughs> great question. Um, so one of the things we did um, that I didn't show you when I was here is I, I had these things set, settle on tiles and I caged them and we found that you cage out the grazers, yes. Get recruit, you don't cage out the grazers, and you give these guys just tiles, which are kind of sterile tiles that you settle them on, you knock down everything. Um, you, uh, cage the grazers out, you get recruitment. On the benthos, these things have these microhabitats, which allow them, which I think allows them to escape some grazing. Um, George Leonard, who was a, a, a student here um, in the very early 90s, did some great work with the bat star uh, Bateria miniata on giant kelp, and found huge impacts of um, the, the bat star, and can completely knock down um, uh, uh, the microscopic stages. Um, we've seen work with Lytokinus, the white urchins. Um, yes, so grazing on these microscopic stages is hugely important. Um, Angela here is doing some work, um, where's Angela, raise your hand. Uh, is doing some work right now where she's got, the, for Desmarassi out there, she's got um, cages out there with, with grazers in them, without them, to try to look at these things. So we have looked at these things, and where we've looked at them, they've been very important. Matt, it's, uh what does it look like, like the, the thing you're calling the seed bank? If you chipped a rock off or you brought the loose grains back to the lab and put them under the microscope, is it crawling with gametophytes attached everywhere? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, if it's next, so the first year you do this, um, generally, you know, the, they're not as dense, but when you have this, after this first year, you have this incredible dense <coughs> group of sporophytes there. Then the next year, when you um, look that big, they can blank at the bottom um, with uh, gametophytes. And as I showed you, you know, we're getting up 800 per meter squared of the successful recruits. So yeah, we do get, we are pretty sure that in places these things are completely covered. Um, as far as finding them in the field, people have tried that. That's hard, you know. Um, one of the things is, you know, maybe a dipping cone microscope or something like that to look for these. That's been one hypothesi hypothesis. Yeah, people have tried using fluorescent stains to try to find these things in the field. They're microscopic. They're only a few microns in size. so. They're really hard to identify in the field. Um, we tried, I tried doing some stuff when I was here with these, um, trying to see if they were going endolithic, if they were going into the rocks. Um, so getting some resins, and that, was a, that would have been an entire another master's thesis to try to figure out if these things were boring into the rocks and, and um, in, in, you know, impregnating those things with resins and then using um, SCM to, find, to, to look at their kind of where they were. So the, w what they look like on the bottom is, in areas that they probably are, I mean, you can go to areas where these things are incredibly dense, they're all microscopic, but they're so packed in that it does create like a film, and you can do them in the lab where it creates like a fuzz. However, we don't see that. You can actually see it. Uh, if you, in, in the field, you cannot see it. We, I don't know anybody that's ever seen, you know anyone that's ever seen microscopic stages in the field? No. It's all, it's a, it is a black, but it is a hidden line, but it's hidden, so we do things by, by proxy, right? We do these sterilizations that we're assuming we're removing micro. It makes sense to us. And we do things with boulders, where we move boulders around that have them. We have some that we see boulders on and we outplant them. And so we can do work with them, but everything comes down to this assumption that they're there. Um, I think it's pretty good when you start seeing the multitude of experiments all point the same way. But no, we don't see them in the field. And, and just, just and you're using the analogy of the seed bank, but it's really a juvenile bank. Yeah, so I used this thing in the seed bank, and then what I actually did with, um, with, with you <laughs> um, was I did C14 uptake experiments, and I found that these things are not actually dormant. 
Um, they are metabolically active. You can put them under slight differences in light, and they grow differently. We saw um, uh, carbon uptake, so they are photosynthesizing. And that's going to be important because they don't have a protective shell around them. Um, and so that really isolates them from their environment. So these things can have a series of not, what I call non-lethal uh, uh, injuries, which can eventually become lethal. So they have to be able to compensate, you know, to fix, to repair um, damaged tissues. And they also do seem to be, you know, they're ready, they're metabolically active, they're ready. So the instant those light levels or nutrient levels change, they go. And so, yeah, so they are, they're actually more of a bank of, I call them, a, they're more appropriately termed a bank of microscopic stages than it is a seed bank. And, and in other words, they're not hibernating. They're no, not they're not. To go. No, they're not, they're not, they're not truly dormant. No, not at all. So uh, we just, in a recent seminar um, on kelp biogeography, showed that the connectedness of individual populations was really important in how quickly they recovered from local extinction. But so you're saying that they have these seed banks, um, which would lead me to believe that the connectedness shouldn't be as important that they'd be able to recover from their own seed banks. So I guess with your work, why do you think that the connectedness was still so important in being able to recover from local extinction after disturbance? Uh, great question. I'm going to point you back to my uh, uh, former student, Laura Carney's work. Um, who worked with Felipe Alberto um, and, and Andy Bohanek, uh, some uh, geneticists, and what they did is they looked at parentage, and they actually looked at, within a kelp bed, um, how, when you look at the seed bank, where does that come from? And the, the short answer of the Papers in Ecology, it's a long paper to go into, um, but the short answer of that is when you look at the seed bank, it's not just a one-time, one-individual deal, it is a mixed bank of different age, so things are constantly settling there and from different individuals. So these seed banks already would, these into microscopic stages, we would already assume that they um, that you have and um, uh, gametophytes from a whole host of different um, parentage. And she actually looked at parentage analysis and found that you know you can identify parent offspring pairs over the course you know over tens of kilometers. And so we actually looked at when we talk about connectedness, um, it's not just within the population that's recovering. You know, you always want to bring in new genes, you know, right, and have that. And so there, we are bringing, those seed banks are a mixture of what's happening locally and what's happening some distance away. So it's a mix of mixed origin. And Matt, how long do you think these stages persist? Um, I cut that out of today's talk. Um, and so what we did with, the, with um, Desmarestia is um, we went in there and we assumed, that are they just a couple of, uh, we, you know, one season or is it multiple years? And so what we did is we took the boulders that had, that we assumed had um, the microscopic stages on them. And we took half those boulders, we took them in the sun to quickly um, kill them in the sun. And then we had, we had transplanted them at Stillwater Cove, very deep, um, to about 130 feet or so where it was dark. It was a distance from the nearest source, so we would kind of hold them in that quiescent phase. And then first year we moved them up, boom, got recruitment on the, 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 tree, uh, the, you know, the ones with the seed banks, not the ones that were sun dried. Move the next year's up, same thing. They're at least a year and a half. The third year of that experiment, that was just, you know, schlepping rocks, boulders around at 130 feet is not the way you want to go, right, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, Diana helped me with that one. And it was just so difficult to do what you didn't even do the third year. Um, but, uh, but at least a year and a half. And how do you know they weren't just recently settled? Um, we don't know that, but we used to take a numerical difference. We take the difference between the two. If it was all recently settled, we should see no difference between the boulders. But the, the differences between the boulders persisted for a year and a half. So the differences between the treatments. And the magnitude of the difference is almost identical between treatments, even though the total numbers changed a little bit, that effect size stayed the same. And so what we saw was that, yeah, over even a year and a half later, those things that had this bank of uh, microscopic stages first year, that conveyed two years later. Isn't that it? All right. Thank you very much.